Try to find a sense of nourishment in the breath, because the mind needs nourishment. If it doesn't find its food here, it's going to go looking someplace else, as long as we're beings. We need to feed. The Buddha pointed out that's the thing that we all have in common. All beings depend on nutriment. And as long as we enjoy feeding, we're going to keep on being beings. This is why the teaching that Buddha has that we suffer because of our clinging goes so much against the grain. Because the Pali word for clinging, upadana, also means to feed, to take sustenance. So the very thing that defines us also means that we have to suffer. And why the way away from suffering is going to involve disenchantment and dispassion. The Pali word for disenchantment, nibbida, actually means a sense you don't want to feed anymore. You've been hoodwinked into believing that the food is good. And then you suddenly see that what you've been feeding on involves a lot of suffering. Now, if this were our only option, we'd say, well, put up with it. And the uh, desire to stop feeding would be depression. But the Buddha saw there was another alternative. There was a happiness that doesn't depend on feeding. That's what we're practicing for. Which is why he said that practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma means to practice for the sake of disenchantment. This is a principle that's got long roots in the forest tradition. As John Swat said, one of John Munn's favorite Dharma topics was practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. It means several things. especially nowadays, means practicing the Dharma as the Dharma is, You're not trying to change the Dharma to suit yourself. Tell about the new, new ideas of what the Buddha would have taught if he'd come to the 21st century, which would have been different from what he taught then. Saying, well, since he's not here to do that, we can make the changes ourselves. In fact, I know of one teacher who has made lots of changes in the Vinaya, saying the Buddha is our father, he'd be happy to see his children bringing things up to date. But the Buddha warned against changes in the Dharma again and again and again. His image was of a drum, one of those drums back in the old days where you would take a piece of wood, hollow it out, stretch the drum head over it. And the integrity of the wood was what made the, the drum resonant. But then it would get a crack and you'd fill the crack with a peg and then another crack and fill that with a peg. And bit by bit, the drum would get less resonant, until finally there's nothing but pegs. That drum would be worthless. So when you make up your mind, you're going to practice the Dharma as it's taught. That's one meaning of practicing the Dharma for, in accordance with the Dharma. In the time of the Buddha, though, you've been practicing for the sake of disenchantment for the sake of not having to feed. That first means looking at the way you feed and seeing that it's not worth it. This is where the analysis of the those five steps that the Buddha teaches about comes in. You look for the origination of whatever desire you have for four or more feelings or perception, thought, constru thought constructs, consciousness. You look to see how it originates in the mind. What is it in the mind that wants these things, that wants to take the raw materials, the potentials in the present moment for these things, and turn them into actual aggregates? And then from the aggregates make all kinds of other things. It's usually because we want pleasure of some kind or another. We delight in these things. In other words, they look delicious. We think, well, if I'm a good cook, I can turn them into things that I want.
but then the delight fades away. This is going to be disappointed, but then we figure it's worth it. That's the allure, seeing that the disappointment doesn't matter, or the suffering that's entailed somehow makes us noble. This is one of the ways of looking at suffering that really pulls people back. The idea that the more you suffer, the more sensitive you are, the higher level as you are as a, as a human being, the more spiritual. And in a religion where the symbol at the front of the chapel is always somebody suffering, it's easy to think that in those ways. But look here, is the Buddha suffering? Our Buddha images we have here. Occasionally you will find pictures of the Buddha going through his austerities. But that's the Buddha on the wrong path. The Buddha on the right path is the one who looks content. And he's content not because he just told himself to be content with whatever. It's because he found something that really is worthy of contentment, a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness that's totally satisfying. And his vision of the world. There's lots of suffering in the world, but there's nobody planning anything. So the suffering doesn't serve any higher purpose, and it doesn't make us more, more noble than other people. So you have to learn how to see through that suffering, to see that it's really not worth it. That's when you can get beyond it. Now the idea of not feeding is something that goes so against the grain, because that's where our happiness lies, in feeding off of forms and feelings and perceptions and thought constructs and consciousness. And as part of the path, we do have to feed. This is why we talk about feeding off the breath, feeding off the pleasure of the breath. But learn to really appreciate this. Learn to become a connoisseur of your breathing, so you can pry yourself loose from your other attachments, the things that you used to feed on. Because this feeding is relatively innocent. A lot of other feeding depends on feeding on other people, emotionally, mentally. As long as the mind is in the feeding mode, then even our compassion for other beings is feeding off of them somehow. That same Dharma teacher who wanted to change the Vinaya was also the one who said he couldn't ever want to live in a world where there was no suffering, because then he wouldn't be able to exercise his compassion, which sounds noble. And, but then you start thinking about it. You want to feed off your compassion, and your compassion has to feed off of the sufferings of others. That's an element of selfishness in there. So we learn how to take things apart in the mind, to see that things we're feeding on in some cases are worth it for the time being because they're part of the path, but there are a lot of other things off the path. We have to learn how to develop a sense of distaste, disenchantment. You get more and more focused on the path. Because once you get all of your desires for food focused on the path, and then when you can see, okay, this too is not really worthy of contentment, that's when the mind is finally going to be really inclined toward the, toward the unfabricated, going against his old habits of wanting to feed here and feed there. But again, this is not depression. This is not looking at the world and just giving up. It's, because, it's actually looking for something higher, something better. And as the Buddha pointed out, it exists. There is such a thing. I mean, that's why his path is said to be the path of victory, winning out over this, this desire to feed, so that you're no longer feeding on the aggregates. You've got something better. That it's not related to the aggregates at all. And some people complain and say, if you're not feeding, then 
If you go for dispassion, how can you have compassion for others? Well, it's a different kind of compassion, because you remember those people who've gone beyond, beyond suffering. They look back and they see all the other people who are still suffering, and they know what it was like. They've been there. So they have to have compassion. But their compassion is the kind that doesn't feed on you, which is why it's really genuine. So we're changing our feeding habits. It's going to require reordering a lot of things inside. But then wherever there's feeding, there's insecurity, which is one of the reasons why the goal, which has many names, has as one of its names the secure. So always keep that in mind. 